this race there. So Joe, we're going to get started. Let me, um, great. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Andre Mansour. I'm a physician in Portland, Oregon. And we have people from all around the world today, um, which is great. I looked at the kind of the list of, of countries and one country in particular caught my eye, which was Trinidad and Tobago. And my dad's a Trinidadian. So it's nice to have a Trini in the audience. I've been to Trinidad many times. It's a great island. So welcome and welcome everyone. Um, this talk is about diagnostic reasoning, and it will borrow heavily from concepts featured in my textbook, Frameworks for Internal Medicine. So we should begin by asking the question, what is diagnostic reasoning? And to me, you know, if I, if I were to define diagnostic reasoning, I would say that it is the skillful acquisition and use of clues from the patient's history, exam, and other data let me turn my video off here. Joe's yelling at me. There we go. So it is the skillful acquisition and use of clues from the patient's history, exam, and other data to make a diagnosis. Similar to how a detective would gather and use clues from a crime scene to solve a case. And again, it's the acquisition and use of clues with an emphasis on acquisition. You could have the same crime scene and you could have 10 detectives evaluate that crime scene. And some of them are going to glean important pieces of information from the crime scene that others will gloss over or miss entirely. And the same is true in medicine. As clinicians, we have to extract the clues from the patients that we later use to solve the case. Making a diagnosis is an art form and a skill that requires understanding and uh, practice. And it's really something that I think students and residents should be focused on during training. And even after residency, clinicians should be focused on kind of honing this skill during their careers. Once a diagnosis is made, treatment and management can always be looked up. You can always sort of, if you make the diagnosis of acute pericarditis, you can look up what the latest treatment recommendation is, whether it's an NSAID or colchicine, you know, you can uh, look up the dosing, all of that stuff. The process of making a diagnosis is not so simple. To make a diagnosis, a clinician at the very least has to do three things. First, the clinician has to know what information is important to acquire from a case. And, you know, you know, you don't want to be in a situation where you're asking the patient every question you could imagine, hoping to stumble into an answer that helps you, or you do a head to toe physical exam, hoping to stumble across a physical finding that will help you. You could do that, but you would be highly inefficient if you did that. You want to allow the case to kind of direct your questioning, direct your physical, uh, you know, exam, and you want to know what information is important to acquire, but it's not enough to know what information you, you need to know from a case. You have to have the skills to acquire that information. What do I mean by that? Well, if you know that the lung exam is gonna be important in a particular case, it's, that's useless unless you know how to percuss, to, to find that effusion, unless you know how to auscultate the lungs to hear those crackles and, and diagnose that, that pneumonia. So you have to know what information is important to acquire. You have to have the skills to acquire that information. And then finally, you have to take that information and synthesize it to make a diagnosis. And all of these three steps are related. So without one, you won't be able to do two. Without two, you won't be able to do three. And without three, you won't be able to make a diagnosis. And you know, standardized tests sort of, they, they serve a role and they serve a purpose, but they really ignore the first two. And they just simply present to you clues in a cookie cutter way where they tell you that the patient was in India last month. They, they give you the S3 Gallup. And in the real world, the clinician has to acquire those data points. It's not simply that the patient doesn't show up with signs saying, you know, I was in Afghanistan last month or I have an S3 Gallup. You should listen right here. Patients don't do that. The clinician has to acquire that information. And, um, you know, in the case of the S3 Gallup, it's multi, it's multi layered. So the, the clinician has to know, number one, that listening to the heart is important in this particular case. Secondly, the patient, the, the clinician has to know how to listen to the heart. 
Third, they have to be able to appreciate that S3 gallop. And fourth, they have to be able to synthesize that S3 gallop and know how it shapes the case moving forward. And by the way, this is why computers will never replace internal medicine doctors. You know, I think we can all imagine a world, and it may already exist, where there's a machine and you input information into that machine and, and it will output a diagnosis. But that information that goes into that machine has to be acquired by someone and that someone is, an, is a clinician. So I'm gonna take you guys through three cases in which these three patients presented with dyspnea. And hopefully these three cases will illustrate that point that, that knowing what information to acquire and having the skills to acquire that information are incredibly important to making a diagnosis. We, we don't wanna just synthesize information given to us. We wanna be able to know the information that we need and to acquire that information. So let's look at patient number one. So here, again, this patient is presenting with, with dyspnea and here are three images, one of the patient's mouth, second one of the patient's hands, and the third of the patient's chest. And what findings are present here? And Kushal has already sort of answered the second step of that, of that question, which is that this looks like somebody with Marfan syndrome. There's a high arched palate, there's arachnodactyly or spider-like long thin fingers, and there's a pectus deformity in the form of pectus, pectus carinatum in this case. And you know, if a clinician is given these clues, these images side by side, it's not that difficult to come up with a diagnosis of Marfan syndrome. Well, at least it's a lot easier to come up with a diagnosis, the unifying diagnosis. And in the form of a standardized test, you might be given, this patient has a high arch palate, this patient has arachnodactyly, and this patient has a pectus deformity. And a computer, a robot, can take that, those clues and say, ah, that, that must be Marfan syndrome. And we wanna be the clinicians who can not only synthesize clues as they come to us, but we want to be the clinicians that know that, hey, it's important to look at the palate in this case because Marfan's is entering into my mind. So I know to look at the, at the palate and I can you know, not only know to look at the palate, but I can recognize a high arch palate. I know not only that I want to look at the hands in this case, but I can recognize arachnodactyly. Not only do I know that I can look at, that I should look at the chest wall in this case, but I can recognize a pectus deformity. That's the type of clinician that you wanna be. And we're not done with this case. So, that, so this patient presented with dyspnea. So in a patient who has Marfan syndrome, who's presenting with dyspnea, what, uh, what conditions would you suspect? Let me ask you more specifically, what valvular conditions exactly, Kushal? So you can get aortic regurgitation as a result of Marfan syndrome because of aortic root dilation. And so a hypothesis enters into your mind and you think, okay, I, this patient could have aortic regurgitation. So when you listen to the chest, you're specifically going to anticipate potentially hearing a diastolic murmur. And everything in medicine is all about anticipation. The, the eyes do not see what the mind doesn't know. And this is true for almost everything in medicine. I, I find myself, in, you know, where I where I never want to be surprised by anything that I see uh, from something that I order. If I order an EKG, I already want to know in my mind what I should be anticipating to see on that EKG. When I look at a patient's neck, I want to know what I should be looking for in that neck. It's all about anticipation. And so if you have Marfan syndrome in mind and you're thinking about aortic regurgitation, you should listen to the chest. And what are you going to hear? You're going to hear a diastolic a decrescendo diastolic murmur, and that's exactly what we hear in this case. Now, if you're thinking aortic regurgitation, what findings should you, might you be able to appreciate in the patient's neck? Organs pulse, exactly, Kushal. So you look at the, at the patient's neck and sure enough, you see Corrigan's pulse. And this is a bounding carotid pulse in the patient's neck. 
And so it's all coming together now. It's all coming together. This patient has aortic regurgitation um, as a result of Marfan's underlying uh, Marfan syndrome. And again, this emphasizes the point. If all of these clues are given to you, I think a robot, a machine can put it all together and spit out the diagnosis of aortic insufficiency. And that, and that, is, that is part of diagnostic reasoning. That is part of making a diagnosis. But you want to be the clinician who knows that it's important to look in the mouth, who knows that it's important to look at the hands, to look, to listen to the heart and, and hear that diastolic murmur, and to look at the, uh, the carotid pulsation for Corrigan's pulse. Yes, Austin, that is the same as a bounding, uh, it's the same as a bounding pulse. Corrigan's pulse refers specifically to uh, the carotid pulse, whereas the water hammer pulse specifically refers to uh, a more peripheral pulse like the, like the uh, radial pulse. So you want to be the clinician who, who can extract these clues uh, from the patient to make a diagnosis. Let's look at patient number two here. So here we're gonna look at his uh, jugular venous pulse and we'll let the video play. And what do you guys notice about the jugular venous pulse here? So there it is in the middle of the neck. When he takes a breath in right here, it starts to climb up the neck. And that is Kussmaul sign. Andrew's absolutely right. And so you have Kussmaul sign. And what else do you notice about this patient? What, what do you see here? What is this skin mark right here underneath the A-wave in our, in our logo here? Anybody know what this is? And, you, and if you looked, you might see, absolutely, Alex, that is a radiation tattoo. And David, nice job. So this patient has Kussmaul sign and a radiation tattoo. And what, how could you put those two pieces of information, those two clues together in a patient presenting with dyspnea? Yep, and that's what he had, kind of, yeah, constrictive, constrictive pericarditis, exactly. Now, if we think back to our machine and we input into that machine, Kussmaul sign and radiation tattoo markers, it will output constrictive pericarditis. And it might also say, hey, this patient could have radiation-induced valvulopathy causing right heart failure and Kussmaul sign. This patient could also have radiation-induced interstitial lung disease with core pulmonale and right heart failure with Kussmaul sign. You wanna be, the, I mean, the point is, is that that machine can only come up with that diagnosis when these clues are presented to it. You want to be the clinician who notices the Kussmaul sign, who observes the Kussmaul sign, who notices the radiation tattoos. And this is what the radiation tattoo marker looks like. Th th this right here, it looks like it basically, it's usually blue ink. And usually it's, it's kind of, um, it, it's arranged in a field. You'll see multiple tattoo markers that are outlining a field, and that is uh, their radiation field. Let's move on to patient number three. And this patient did indeed have constrictive pericarditis from radiation therapy for Hodgkin's. I think somebody uh, mentioned that in the chat. So let's move on to patient number three. Again, a patient presenting with dyspnea. What do you notice about these, uh, these vital signs here? Is there anything that catches your attention? He is hypertensive. Yep, that's right. Anything else about that blood pressure? It is wide. You guys are absolutely right on this. So he has a wide pulse pressure, okay? And so that should generate a hypothesis in your mind. What would you look for in the patient's hand, specifically in their fingernails? Yep, and James, you're, you're one step ahead. So if you look at his hands, you're thinking about aortic regurgitation. You look at his fingernails, and what are you specifically looking for? Could be a splinter from uh, infective endocarditis. Could be Quinky's pulse, exactly. And that's what this patient has. So if you look at this video closely, do you guys all appreciate that pulsation in the nail bed? That is Quinky's pulse. And you guys have already answered that question, which the question being, what is wide pulse pressure and Quinky's pulse typically associated with? And it's usually aortic insufficiency. What if I told you, what if I told you that this patient did not have a diastolic murmur on exam and this patient's echocardiogram showed a completely pristine aortic valve with normal systolic function? What would you say then? Exactly, and Kushal is mentioning anemia, hyperthyroidism. He is getting at something called high output heart failure. And it turns out that wide pulse pressure and Quinky's pulse are physical findings of 
high output physiology from any cause, not just aortic regurg. And you guys are already supplying what I was going to ask you next, answers for what I was going to ask you next, which is what are the causes of high output heart failure? Severe anemia, thyrotoxicosis, wet berry berry. Absolutely. And so um, that if, if, if thiamine deficiency or wet berry berry is in your differential, what question might you ask the patient? You might go back to him and say, you know, what risk factor could this patient have? What's the most common risk factor? Absolutely, alcohol use. And if you ask this patient that question, he would tell you that he drank three or four glasses of wine every day. And he, in fact, did have wet berry berry. He had severe thiamine deficiency. And why is this such a, a, a great case to illustrate how important these, these clues are? You have to acquire these clues. Why is it so important? This patient would have been given, under ordinary circumstances, would have been given the diagnosis of heart failure. So he had the clinical syndrome of heart failure. He had elevated JVP. He was short of breath. He had orthopnea, PND. He would have been given the diagnosis of heart failure with preserved systolic function. He would have been given a handful of diuretics and sent home and said, we're going to treat you symptomatically. How did the wide pulse pressure and the Quinky's pulse completely change the case? Well, that got us down the road of could this patient have high output heart failure? And then that led to the diagnosis of wet beriberi. And why is it so important to diagnose wet beriberi in this case? Because this is curable. With treatment, including alcohol cessation and thiamine replacement, over the course of several weeks, 28 to be exact, this patient's pulse pressure completely narrowed from 100 at the start to around 60 at, the, at, you know, at, at week 28. And he was cured, entirely cured of heart failure. He no longer needed diuretics. All he needed was to stop drinking alcohol and to uh, take thiamine replacement. And so, again, this case illustrates how important it is to acquire the information that you need to make the diagnosis. It was so critical to make the diagnosis of wet beriberi in this case because it cured this patient. How many clinicians would... You know, if 10 clinicians evaluate this patient, how many of them would recognize the wide pulse pressure and then know to look for Quinky's pulse? Am I going to look for Quinky's pulse in every patient I ever evaluate? Absolutely not. Am I going to order thiamine levels in every patient I ever evaluate? Absolutely not. It's going to be hypothesis driven. And, uh, and you want to be that type of clinician who knows what information you need to gather, and then you can gather that information. So again, to diagnose, a clinician must know what information is important to acquire have the skills to acquire that information and then synthesize that information to make a diagnosis. And we're gonna focus for a moment on how you can know what information is important to acquire. And what is my strategy for that? Well, I think creating a differential diagnosis is help, really helpful for this. I try to identify a problem, whether it's a symptom or a physical finding or a laboratory abnormality. I try to identify a problem in a patient's case that I can generate a differential diagnosis around. And the earlier you do this, the better. Why? Because now your, your interaction with the patient is gonna be highly efficient. It's gonna be hypothesis driven. You're gonna ask hypothesis driven historical questions. You're gonna ask, or you're gonna look for hypothesis driven physical findings, and you're going to order hypothesis driven laboratory tests. And it's always a back and forth, at least for me. I almost, you know, and sometimes if it's very straightforward, I will conclude my, um, you know, visit with the patient in one visit. But oftentimes, I go back and forth. I'll leave the patient after my initial interview and, and exam, and I'll go back and I will, I will create my differential diagnosis. And sometimes I do this in real time in the in the patient's room. But sometimes I, especially in the harder cases, I'll come back out of out of the room. I'll sit at my desk. I'll I'll generate my differential diagnosis. And now you have a collection of hypotheses. And when something and when you have a hypothesis, now you know what information you need to rule that hypothesis in or out. So if heart failure shows up on my differential and I realize, you know, I didn't, didn't ask the patient specifically about orthopnea or PND or weight gain, I go back for a second visit and I ask those questions. I look at the jugular venous pulse. I listen for that S3. And that's how this interplay really works. It's very helpful to generate your differential diagnosis early on. And an important point is that the, um, the history and the physical exam are all you need for 90% of diagnoses. And they're free. They're absolutely free. And, you know, when you resort to the shotgun approach where you're ordering 
every test you can think of on every patient that you see. For example, thiamine in, the, in, in patient number three. Are we ordering thiamine levels on every patient that we ever see? Absolutely not. We did that because we had a hypothesis and it proved our hypothesis correct. So you wanna be hypothesis driven in, your, in, your, uh, in the way you order lab results as well. It, part of, of diagnostic reasoning is being a steward in that sense and being judicious in what and how you interact with the patient. Your history and your exam are gonna be highly efficient. Your laboratory testing is going to be um, financially or fiscally responsible. And uh, you know, the ordering the shotgun approach to labs comes at a high cost to patients, both literally because these tests cost money and figuratively because testing begets more testing begets procedures. When you order that CT scan unnecessarily and you find that spot in the liver that otherwise would have been sitting there doing nothing, that obligates you to uh, work it up. And then, you, and then all of a sudden, the patient's undergoing a biopsy, a liver biopsy for a spot that otherwise would have, would have done nothing, would have been completely benign. And now they're hemorrhaging in the ICU. So these types of things come at high cost to patients. And part of diagnostic reasoning is being a steward and ordering only the tests that you need to order and being very efficient in your history and your physical exam. So let's talk specifically about the differential diagnosis. It really should be more than just a list. It has to be organized. It should be organized. And the example that I like to give is imagine if I asked you to name all of the states of the United States of America randomly as quickly as you can. Well, you'd, you'd get going for a while and then eventually you'd, come, you'd slow down and come to a stop. If instead of doing it randomly, you had some method behind it, you know, let's say you, you decided you were gonna do it alphabetically and you started with the states that started with letter A, then B, then C, then D, and so on. Or you did it geographically and you said, okay, I'm gonna start in the Northwest, then I'm gonna to move to the Southwest, Northeast, Southeast. You'd be a lot better off and you'd be able to recall that long list of states a lot more easily. And the same is true in medicine, we are asked to memorize or know the differential diagnosis for so many different problems. And oftentimes it's a long list. There are 50 things that cause chest pain. There are 50 things that cause arthritis, 50 things that cause dyspnea. And here is a list of systemic vasculitides. And I find this very difficult to wrap my mind around. I would encourage you not to create a linear list in your mind, but you must organize that list in some way. And that is what a framework is. A framework is nothing more than an organized differential diagnosis. Here we have systemic vasculitis ordered uh, in terms of the size of blood vessel involved, large vessel, medium vessel, small vessel. There are many benefits to the framework system. Um, the first one that I want to focus on is how it can improve your memory and recall. I remember when I was a student and I learned my first framework, which was acute kidney injury, pre-renal, intrarenal, post-renal. And I'm sure many of you have had a similar experience, but that was a moment for me where I realized this really helps me, um, this really helps me remember this long list of diagnoses. And so I began to, to write this book and I started to come up with frameworks for lots of many, uh, uh, many uh, common problems in internal medicine. And it's interesting because I wrote the book and I figured, you know, it's common sense, or at least in my experience, it really helped me remember these differential diagnoses. But, you know, when I started to write the intro to the book, I realized that, you know, this is just anecdotal. I wonder if there is evidence that, that uh, having a framework system enhances memory and recall. And so I started to explore the memory and learning literature from the 50s and 60s. And they did some pretty amazing, amazing uh, uh, studies where they, where they gave one group of individuals a random list of words and they asked them to memorize it. They gave a different group the same list of words, but they had the benefit of, of those words being organized or tethered together in some way. And uh, the, the outcome of the study showed definitively that those who had the benefit of, of uh, words that were organized were able to remember that list much more easily. And here's one example from that literature and here, what does this look like? This is a framework. This is a framework for approaching minerals. And so uh, there is evidence behind uh, the you know, frameworks being uh, great for memory and recall. Secondly, depending on the framework, it can um, give you a diagnostic workup or it can at least sort of set you off on that path. 
So if we look at the framework for systemic vasculitis, again, organized by the size of blood vessels, if we focus on the small vessel arm, it's subdivided into ANCA positive cases and ANCA negative cases or etiologies. And so if you're approaching a patient and, and small vessel vasculitis enters your mind and you have this framework in your mind, you're automatically equipped to begin a diagnostic pursuit. And that automatically suggests a serologic study that you'd wanna get in that case. The same is true for the uh, framework for pleural effusion, which the initial branch point is whether the fluid is a transidate or exudate. And that's of course based on lights criteria. But this automatically suggests to you when you're approaching a patient with pleural effusion of unknown etiology, this automatically suggests number one, I have to sample that fluid. I have to perform a thoracentesis. Number two, I have to send that fluid for certain studies, including protein and LDH. And uh, if we look at the framework for hyponatremia, again, looking at the hypotonic arm, this subdivides causes into volume status, hypovolemic, euvolemic, hypervolemic. Here, instead of a laboratory test, it is a physical exam maneuver. So you want to pay close attention to volume status in these patients who are presenting to you with hyponatremia. So we're going to take these uh, principles and we're going to try to, uh, we're going to approach a case. And this is a case from the book. And you'll notice that I've concealed some of the information from this case. And I've concealed it because I don't want to commit the sin that I railed against earlier in the talk, which is what standardized tests do. They give you, they present to you on a silver platter. Here are all the, the clues that you need to solve this case. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to start with the bare bones of the case. Then we're going to build a framework for the case. And that framework will serve as our collection of hypotheses. And using that collection of hypotheses, we're going we're gonna to try to figure out what information we need to know. That's number one. We're going to extract that information from the patient, and then we're going to synthesize it to come up with a diagnosis. So I'm going to read this case. This is a 51-year-old man with a history of chronic hepatitis C infection complicated by cirrhosis who presents to the emergency department with shortness of breath. He has been followed by a hepatologist for management of hepatic encephalopathy, ascites, and esophageal varices, which have been stable for several years. The patient has a history of shortness of breath that typically resolves following large volume paracentesis, which he is occasionally required. However, over the past few months, the patient has noticed progressive dyspnea despite control of the ascites. The heart rate is 100 beats per minute. Respiratory rate is 24 breaths per minute. Hemoglobin oxygen saturation by pulse oximetry is 85% on room air with the patient in the upright position. Arterial blood gas on room air shows that the pH is 7.48. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 32 millimeters of mercury, and the partial pressure of oxygen is 56 millimeters of mercury. What is the most likely cause of hypoxemia in this patient? Okay, so let's choose a framework to build our differential diagnosis around. So what, what are some things that we could build a differential around here? Dyspnea would be a great choice. Hypoxemia would be another great choice. Those are both excellent choices. And sometimes in cases of particularly ones that are multi-layered, have the patient has multiple problems going on, it's complex. Sometimes you can build multiple frameworks and then see where the overlap is. And that functions similarly to a, uh, to a Venn diagram. And then you can focus on those conditions that overlap. So for the sake of this talk, we're gonna go with hypoxemia. And before we get to the framework, we're just, we're just going to all get on the same page here and, and, and just understand a little bit more about hypoxemia. So what is hypoxemia? It's a physiologic state in which the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is less than 80. And we all remember the oxygen saturation uh, curve, the hemoglobin saturation curve, where on the x-axis, we have the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood. And on the y-axis, we have the percent hemoglobin that's saturated. And obviously, as the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood goes up, so does the saturation of hemoglobin. But it's not a linear relationship. It's not a 45-degree straight line. It's an S-shaped curve. And I would suggest that the numbers that I commit to memory, and I would suggest that you do the same, with 27 millimeters of mercury in, in arterial blood, because that corresponds to uh, hemoglobin saturation of 50%. The other number that I commit to memory is 60, because that corresponds to around 90%. And 
And I just find that helpful to kind of create a frame of reference for myself when I'm thinking about hypoxemia and partial pressure of oxygen and uh, percent saturation. So let's begin to build our framework for hypoxemia. So the first branch point here is whether the patient has a normal AA gradient or whether the patient has an elevated AA gradient. So that begs the question, what is the AA gradient? The AA gradient is simply the, the, the difference in partial pressure bet uh, between the alveolus, the partial pressure of oxygen between the alveolus and arterial blood. So the alveoli, the lungs are the big A, and the little a is the arterial blood. So you take one number, you subtract from it the other number, and out comes the AA gradient. So this is just how the body works. We inhale oxygen into the lungs, and we try to get this oxygen here to diffuse across into the capillary. So, we, so the AA gradient is simply the difference between the partial pressure of oxygen in this space in the lung compared to the partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary, the arterial blood. So how do we obtain big A, or how do we know how much oxygen is in the alveoli, and how do we obtain the little a, or how much oxygen is in arterial blood? Big A is obtained using the alveolar gas equation, and little a is obtained by measuring um, the oxygen content of arterial blood. So let's focus for a moment on the um, alveolar gas equation, and, and I know equations are sometimes tough to look at, but this is one that I would encourage you all to memorize, commit this to memory. It's one of those equations in medicine that really help you understand physiology. It's sort of like cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. That really helps understand hemodynamics. The alveolar gas equation, same thing. This really helps you understand physiology. So here we have big A, so uh, the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial in uh, alveolar, in the alveoli, is equal to the fraction of inspired oxygen times atmospheric pressure minus the content of CO2 in arterial blood divided by the respiratory quotient. So what is the fraction of inspired oxygen of room air? That's 21%. What is barometric or atmospheric pressure at sea level? That's 760 millimeters of mercury or 760 torr. What is water vapor pressure? That's 47. And what is normal partial pressure of CO2 in arterial blood? You guys know? What is roughly normal? Exactly, 40 millimeters of mercury. And what's the respiratory quotient? I wouldn't worry about this so much. It's basically the, the ratio of how much carbon dioxide is produced for oxygen consumed. And it depends on diet, usually 0.8. Exactly, exactly. So let's calculate our, the, the, the partial pressure of oxygen at, that our lungs are seeing. And I made this talk thinking that I would be giving it to people in Portland. And so now I realize we have people all over the world so it does depend on atmospheric pressure, but we'll assume we're at sea level here in Portland, Oregon, or close to sea level. So we're just gonna plug in the numbers. So we're gonna plug in 21% for the fraction of inspired oxygen, 760 minus 47. Our, my uh, PaCO2 is around 40, respiratory quotient around 0.8, and, and it turns out that my lungs are seeing a partial pressure of oxygen of 100 millimeters of mercury, okay? And if my diffusion is normal, which, it, which I hope it is, whatever content of oxygen is here should diffuse across without any difficulty and get into my capillary. So my arterial blood should be pretty close to 100 millimeters of mercury. And that's where we get, that's why we sat 99 to 100%. We're somewhere around 100 millimeters of mercury in arterial blood. And that corresponds to an uh, oxygen saturation of about 99 to 100%. We are allowed a little bit of an AA gradient. It's not always perfect. And at 20 years old, you're allowed an AA gradient of about 17. And at age 80, you're allowed an AA gradient of up to about 38. So let's focus on the part of the framework that deals with a normal AA gradient with somebody who is hypoxemic. Now that may seem paradoxical to you. You may be wondering, how in the world can someone have a normal AA gradient but be hypoxemic? And again, it comes back to the AA gradient. The little a can only be as good as the big A. So if something is preventing your lungs from seeing a high you know, uh, partial pressure of oxygen, then your little a will suffer as well. And you guys are already filling in the answers. So big AO2 is dependent on, we already talked about this. This is, comes back to the alveolar gas equation. If the amount of oxygen coming into the lungs is low, 
whether that's a result of, you know, polluted air, you know, here in America, we, we blow things up on our independence day for reasons that, that, that still don't make sense to me. And that pollutes the air. And so the partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere in the, in, that you're breathing in may not be 21% anymore. You may be at high altitude here. And, and, and so this may be low. You're, you may be hypoventilating. So here you go. So high CO2. Either one of those situations will cause the big A to be abnormally low. So that's a reduced partial pressure of inspired oxygen or hypoventilation, as you guys already mentioned. What are some causes of, and actually before we talk about that, let's, that still may not make sense to you. How can, why do these people have a, a normal AA grade in the setting of hypoxemia? And let's actually go through an example. We'll, we'll calculate the big AO2 in a patient with a partial pressure of oxygen of 80 in arterial blood. So all the same numbers apply, except instead of 40, here we have 80. And so the big AO2 in this situation is only 50 millimeters of mercury. So even if we have a perfect, we have perfect diffusion, our AA gradient is zero. What is here is 50 millimeters of mercury. So even if it's perfect and it diffuses across completely, arterial blood is only gonna have a partial pressure of oxygen of 50. And that is by definition hypoxemic. Partial pressure of oxygen of 50 is gonna to correspond to an O2 sat in the mid 80s. And this patient is absolutely hypoxemic despite a completely normal AA gradient. So the little a is at the mercy of the big A. And what are some causes of reduced partial pressure of inspired oxygen and hypoventilation? You guys already started to name some of these things. So high altitude certainly will reduce your inspired oxygen. Um, you know, polluted air we mentioned. How about hypoventilation? What are some common causes of hypo hypoventilation that we see in the hospital all the time? Yep, opioids, toxins, sleep apnea, obesity, neuromuscular weakness, mechanical obstruction from things like ascites, absolutely. So let's now focus on the other arm of the framework. So now we, we're talking about elevated AA gradient causing hypoxemia. So here we have a situation where what is here is not transmitting to the arterial to the capillary and arterial blood. So we have a problem getting oxygen from here into here. And there are four main causes, four main mechanisms. That is number one, uh, sort of VQ mismatch in the form of dead space. Here you have good V, your, air, your aeration is great. You have good air coming in, you have good oxygenation of your alveoli, but here you have very poor blood flow to that alveoli. And uh, so, so you have VQ mismatch in the form of dead space. You can have here in this situation, you have great blood flow, but you have poor aeration. Your V is poor, your Q is great. And this could be because alveoli are filled with blood, pus, water, they're collapsed, et cetera. Here you have great aeration. So your V is good, your Q is great, but you have some kind of process here, maybe thickening or fibrosis that's preventing oxygen from diffusing across. And then finally, we have a situation in which we have excellent aeration, we have great blood flow, but we have a, a shunt here. We have blood, we have deoxygenated blood making its way right across the alveolus and uh, causing hypoxemia that way. So why don't we just kind of uh, throw out some causes in each category? Maybe we can name one main cause in each category. So what's the classic cause of dead space where you have no blood flow? PE, perfect. How about physiologic shunt? What are some things? that can fill the alveoli and cause physiologic shunt. Yep, ARDS, which itself is not a diagnosis. There are, there are many causes of, of ARDS. Pneumonia, perfect. Uh, this could be filled with, with water, DAH. It could be filled with blood. Yep, pulmonary edema or DAH, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. How about this situation where you have um, some kind of yep, interstitial lung disease? You guys are, are really good. And then in this situation, what, what are the two kind of ma main systems that cause uh, anatomic shunt. Where do those shunts show up? Which which organs? Yep, intracardiac and intrapulmonary. You guys are right on this. So here we have we have our full framework for thinking about hypoxemia. Now, let's go back to our case and figure out what is the AA gradient in this case. That'll help us figure out which arm of the framework we're dealing with. 
So how are we going to calculate the big A? Well, we're going to assume he's breathing 21% oxygen. He's at, you know, sea level. And we have his PaCO2, which is 32 millimeters of mercury. So if we plug in the numbers here, we get a partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs, big A, of 110 millimeters of mercury. And now we have to know what the little a is to calculate the AA gradient. And we know from the case, the little a is 56. This partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood is 56. So 110 minus 56 is 54 millimeters of mercury. So we know, you know, he's in his 50s, so he's allowed up to 27. And that's 54 is twice that. So, so he definitely has an elevated AA gradient. So we know we're dealing with this arm of the framework. And anytime you can dichotomize the differential diagnosis in this way using a framework, it's to your advantage. We know that we don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. This is not, this is not at play. And you might think, you know, is it his ascites from, you know, causing mechanical obstruction and hypoventilation causing his hypoxemia? Well, we know that that's not the case because he has an elevated AA gradient. So we're dealing with a problem in this side of the framework. And it could be, you know, one or more of these conditions. So when you're working through a case like this, again, we do, I hid the clues from the case from you guys. So we're gonna generate the information that we would wanna know in this case. This is how it works in real life. So I'm gonna pick a couple diagnoses here and I'm gonna ask you guys what historical questions you would ask about, what physical findings you would look for. So let's, let's talk about pulmonary embolism. What historical questions would you ask a patient in which you are concerned might have pulmonary embolism? Yep, you might inquire about a history of malignancy, immobility, surgery, trauma to the leg. Exactly, Pro, you know, a history of thrombophilia. How about physical exam? What are you looking for on exam? Yeah, sudden onset dyspnea, that's a great point. Tachycardia, yep, potentially cyanosis. Just, yeah, you're looking for a swollen leg, a source of that PE, it's, you know, there's a chicken before the egg. So you wanna know where's that DVT? Absolutely. You might hear, what might you hear when you uh, ascult the heart? What sound might be louder than normal? P2, exactly. You might have an elevated JVP. How about pneumonia? Pneumonia is on a differential diagnosis. What are we going to be asking the patient about if we're concerned about pneumonia? Cough, fever, malaise, exact sputum production, exactly. How about exam? Here we're looking for focal physical findings. Exactly. How about interstitial lung disease? What, what questions would you ask about if you're concerned about ILD? Yep. Exposures, exposure history, you know, smoke, birds. What do they do for a living? Autoimmune conditions, man, you guys are good. On exam, you're going to listen for a particular type of crackles, Velcro crackles. Exactly. Man, you guys are reading my mind. It's incredible. And I don't want to forget about testing. Don't forget about testing. Your testing should be hypothesis driven as well. Again, we're not going to order thiamine levels on every patient that comes in to see us. We're going to order thiamine levels when we suspect thiamine deficiency. So if we suspect interstitial lung disease, you're going to order PFTs. You're going to order a high resolution CT scan. Exactly. You guys are right on the money. How about, what about this, this case in particular? So this is a patient with cirrhosis. So how can cirrhosis lead to dyspnea? What what etiologies in particular on this list should we be honing in on? We talked about ascites and unlikely in this case because it's not a matter of hypoventilation causing. Yep, so we think about hepatopulmonary syndrome. And what is hepatopulmonary syndrome? Well, that's where patients with cirrhosis develop um, either dilated capillaries at the base of the lung, in which case they, they develop a physiologic shunt, or it, they develop AVMs at the base of the, of the lung. And, what, and what, what historical question would you ask a patient when you're concerned about or you're considering hepatopulmonary syndrome? How do they typically present? What, what type of dyspnea do they have? Exactly, they have platypnea where they are short of breath, sitting up, and it improves when they lie flat. And orthodeoxy is a physical finding, exactly, Robbie. And so, you know, you, are you gonna ask every patient you encounter whether they have platypnea? Absolutely not. That's going to be a, a complete waste of time. You're going to ask those patients in which hepatopulmonary syndrome is a reasonable possibility and it's a hypothesis of yours. 
And why does that happen? Why do they get platinia and orthodeoxia? Well, the, the, the shunts are at the, at the base of the lung. And when they're sitting upright, you, get, you have more blood flow to the base of the lung. So you have a higher shunt fraction in that situation. When they lay flat, when they lie flat, now all of a sudden blood flow is distributed all throughout the, the, all fields of the lung. And now you have less of a shunt fraction. And so you're gonna absolutely ask that question. You're gonna look for ortho, uh, orthodeoxia on exam. And then what, what tests are you gonna order if you're concerned about hepatopulmonary syndrome or, or anatomic shunt? Yep, you're gonna get what's called a bubble study, which is an echocardiogram where you put agitated saline in and, uh, and you'll see those bubbles on the right side of the heart. And those bubbles should never make it their way to the left side of the heart because what happens is they flow to the lungs and they, get, they dissipate within the lung. And so they should never show up on the left side of the heart. But if they do, you know you're dealing with a shunt, either an intracardiac shunt or an intrapulmonary shunt. Does anybody know how you differentiate between an intracardiac shunt and an intrapulmonary shunt? Timing, that's exactly right, Maura. So if it happens early on, that suggests that that's an intracardiac shunt. If it happens later, and that should be within like two or three beats, it should show up on the left side. If it takes a while, to get there, that's because the you know, that's an intrapulmonary shunt. The blood has to go from the right side of the heart to the lung before it can travel through that AVM and back to the left side of the heart. So there's a delay. PFO would be an intracardiac shunt, uh, Manny, and that would be that would be quick. You'd see that within a few uh, beats. So you guys did a great job of pointing out the findings, the the, the historical questions, the exam findings that we would want to know in this case. And so here we go. It's all revealed to you. And here in the history, we see that now we, ha we have the information that the breathing seems to improve when the patient lies on his back. That is platypnea. We have the finding that the, the hypoxemia that's 85% in the upright position now improves to 96% in the supine position. That is orthodeoxia. We have a little bit more on exam. So we have spiders on his chest, which we wouldn't be surprised by because he has cirrhosis. We have a jugular venous pulse of seven, seven centimeters of water, which is normal, and that helps us eliminate heart failure, which shows up as a hypothesis of ours why, of why this patient might be hypoxemic or, or, or dyspneic. The lungs are clear to auscultation. That helps us rule out pneumonia. And here an image of the patient's hand is shown in figure 46.1, and I should have asked you guys this question, but what would you anticipate seeing on exam in a patient that may have a shunt? What would you see? What is this finding? Clubbing. Exactly. How many clinicians evaluating this patient, if you had 10 clinicians evaluating this patient, how many of them would pick up, first of all, would know to look for clubbing, that's number one, and would second know what clubbing looks like? I would say out of 10 clinicians, maybe two or three, and you wanna be in that 20 to 30% that know to look for clubbing and know what clubbing looks like. And then finally, we're given the echo results that you guys asked for, so here it is. So here is the image, uh, transthoracic echocardiogram with agitated saline showing the presence of micro bubbles on the right side of the heart. So here are those bubbles on the right, the left, there are no bubbles. And in somebody without a shunt, you would expect no bubbles to ever show up on the right, on the left side. But here we go, eight cardiac cycles later, now we have bubbles on the left side of the heart. So what is the diagnosis in this case? Yep, absolutely. This is hepatopulmonary syndrome. So in summary, diagnostic reasoning is the acquisition and use of clues to make a diagnosis. At least that's how I think of it. And with, a, with an emphasis on acquisition. Remember, there are three things that we need to do to make a diagnosis. One is to know what information is important to acquire. Two, you have to be able to acquire that information. And three, you have to synthesize it. A machine can synthesize it. A clinician needs to understand what they have to acquire and they have to know how to acquire it. And to help you in understanding what information you need to know, pick a, pick a problem and build a framework early on in the case. And that's your collection of hypotheses. And now you can perform a hypothesis-driven workup, whether it's hypothesis-driven uh, historical questions, exam findings, or laboratory testing. And that's how we should work through a case. That's all I have for you guys.
here are my references. Most of this, you know, comes from the book. Um, the book really, um, you know, has 50 common internal medicine problems and it, uh, it illustrates, uh, there's a framework associated with each of those problems and each chapter starts off with a case and it works through, through the case, much in the same way that we work through that case of hypoxemia and it builds a framework as you go through. We also do stuff on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. We have a couple brilliant medical students, Katie Berry and uh, Mayana Fearborn, who run the Instagram and Facebook pages and they do a great job presenting cases. There are a couple podcasts that I would really recommend that focus on diagnostic reasoning. That's Clinical Problem Solvers and Core IM. Gurpreet Dhaliwal is an absolute master diagnostician. And if you ever have the opportunity, like I have, to see him work through cases in person, it is amazing. And I would really encourage you to take that opportunity. There's an app called Human DX. It's really great for practicing working through cases. And they give you information in aliquots and you should anticipate. Remember what we talked about. Anticipation is key in medicine. You never want to order something and be surprised by what you see on that test result. You want to be able to anticipate everything. So practice as you go through the human DX cases. Practice what that next aliquot of information might tell you. And finally, Physical Diagnosis PDX is a website that we're coming out with. It, it isn't out yet, but it's coming out soon. And we focus on showing you physical findings. It's not enough to know that if I'm considering Marfan syndrome, that I want to look at the hands for arachnidectomy. I want to look in the mouth for high arch palate. I want to look at the chest wall for deformities. It's not enough to know that. You have to know, you have to be able to recognize what those findings are. And so that's the whole idea with this website is we want to show you guys multiple examples of Quinky's pulse, of chest wall deformities, of of uh, arachnidactyly. We want to show you that. That way you can recognize it when you go to the bedside and see patients. And that is all I have for you guys. Um, feel free to, I'm going to turn my video back on here and uh, feel free to ask questions. I'm happy to stick around. We, we have a few minutes for questions. At this point, we're going to allow everyone to unmute themselves so that you can ask a question by your microphone if you'd like. Hey, Dr. Mansour, thank you so, so much. Um, you mentioned that your diet affects the respiratory quotient. Can you please explain that? Uh, probably not very well, um, but <laughs> it has to do with uh, how much oxygen is being consumed and how much carbon dioxide is being produced. So it depends on what, you know, an aerobic respiration, what substrate uh, you're utilizing. Is it carbohydrates? Is it protein? Is it fats? And uh, I'd have to brush up on my basic science knowledge to give you a better explanation than that. But um, the typical diet, the, the respiratory quotient is about 0 0.8. And I can't remember if, you're, if, you're, if your diet is predominantly fats, which way the respiratory quotient goes, or if it's predominantly carbohydrates. But um, it can affect how much, you know, the, the ratio of carbon dioxide produced per oxygen consumed. And that's, that's the gist of it, um, Austin. So if you're telling me I could maybe eat more bagels and make my breathing more efficient? <laughs> well, maybe, uh, that, that, that might be true, but you're, you know, you're in good shape. You're not hypoxemic, so I wouldn't worry about it. Um, any other questions? Hi, Dr. Mansour. This is Mani. Uh, what would you recommend for uh, resources and books to learn more physical exam skills um, other than your website that's coming out soon? Thanks for asking that question, Mani. I would say there are two strategies or two kind of things that I would encourage you guys to do to beef up your physical exam skills. Number one, it does come from a foundation. You have to know the, the information. And, and just like anything else, you have to read about it. And that comes from things like our, our website, but also textbooks, I would recommend, and I can send out this, um, these resources, but uh, Marriott is an excellent uh, physical exam book that focuses on the cardiac exam. It's a book from, I think, the, the early 90s, but the exam hasn't changed. And so you can really uh, learn the foundations using that book. Sapira is another great book, and that's not just cardiac exam, but that's, you know, not only all exams, but also the history as well. So those are the two books that I would recommend. And just like anything else, you know, you can read about something all day long. You know, you can read about how to shoot a jump shot all day long. But, you know, if you go out onto the basketball court and all you've done is read about the mechanics of shooting a basket, 
uh, basketball, you're going to not do very well. So you, it requires also ex experience and, and practice. And the same is true of physical examination. So I would encourage you the second piece of advice, in addition to kind of learning the fundamentals using our website and the books, is to find a mentor, somebody with more experience than you, who can go to the bedside with you and help confirm or deny the findings that you think you're seeing. So there's a, there's a doc at OHSU that, that has served this role for me, Pete Sullivan. And he and I will, to this day, if I think I you know, hear a pericardial knock or I see you know, Friedrich sign in the neck, I will call Pete, I'll bring him into the room, I'll blind him to it and, I'll, and he'll, he'll look at it and he'll tell me what he thinks and he'll do the same of me. So he'll blind me to, to a, a, something that he thinks he sees and I'll go in there and I'll tell him what I see and we'll keep each other in check. And, and that's really the best way to become very proficient at this is to have somebody with more experience to help you at the bedside uh, know whether what you're seeing is truly what you think it is or not. And those are the two pieces of advice that I would give. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Mansour. You're welcome. Um, doctor, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, ah, sorry. Uh, sorry for my English. It's not the most adequate in the world. It's perfect. Um, my question is, <laughs> my question is, thank you. Um, sometimes I kind of feel frustrated because in, in, to make it short, a CT scan can detect things a lot better than whatever I, effort I put to hear whatever crackles I, I, I think there are. I, in, in short, I th sometimes I feel that physical examination is kind of pointless when test, when test labs are so good at detecting things that we were never able, we were able to. And to top it all, there are some there are several studies that directly compare physical examination with lab with lab with lab tests and lab on the on the test are winning almost one hundred percent of the time. The what's your take on it? Okay, yeah, great question. Uh, thanks for asking that. So I would say two things. Number one, I would take um, the uh, the the studies on physical examination with a grain of salt. And and why would I take it with a grain of salt? Well. If you look back at these studies where they, where they look at you know, how good the jugular venous pulse exam is, a lot of these studies used medical students and residents and you know, clinicians who aren't necessarily trained in this uh, as, their, as their users of the test. And that they, no offense to medical students or residents, but they just don't have the training necessary to be able to use that test. So it ends up being a test of the test user rather than a test of the test itself, if that makes sense. An analogy is, if you're looking at how good CTA is for picking up pulmonary embolism, if I'm the one reading the CTA, it's gonna look like a terrible test, right? It's gonna have a very poor sensitivity, very poor specificity. But if you have a trained radiologist, you know, reading the CTA, it's gonna have a sensitivity and specificity of 95 plus percent. And the same is true of physical examination. So you really, if you really wanna test the test, you have to do the study with individuals who are trained in physical examination. So that's, that's what I would say about the studies. And I would take them with a grain of salt. The other point is, is that, um, you know, again, are, do you, do you want to be the type of clinician who orders a CT scan on everyone? Or do you want to be the clinician who orders CT scans selectively? And when it's hypothesis driven, and it goes back to that, the patient number three, are we going to order niacin levels on every patient that we ever see. No, you'd be wasting money. You'd be wasting money if you order CT scans on everybody. Not only uh, literally will you, will you cost the patient money, but figuratively you will cost them as well. I made the point earlier that if you order CT scans haphazardly, you're gonna find something. There are incidental findings that you're gonna pick up on and then they're gonna get a biopsy of their liver and they're gonna bleed to death. And that, uh, that death didn't have to happen. And it happened because we ordered a CT scan unnecessarily. So I would say that, again, diagnostic reasoning is being judicious and being a steward of, of the tests that you order. And so you want to be the type of clinician that orders a CT scan and already knows what the CT scan is going to show you based on your, on your history and your physical exam. And remember, again, history and physical exam are going to give you 90% of diagnoses. So keep that in mind as well. So please... Don't order CT scans and echoes and ultrasounds on every, every patient that comes across your office because then you would be doing them a, a big disservice. I hope that answered your question. 
perfectly. May I, I allow to ask a uh, second question? Sure. <laughs> sure um, following on that training, I feel, I don't know it's everybody's experience, but I feel that after medical school, the training in, in finding physical examination and physical and clinical science stops. <laughs> I'm right. not sure if that's right. a common experience. No, you're absolutely right. And, and you have to, to um, you know, t take it upon yourself to not let that happen to you. And, that, and that's what having a, a buddy like Pete Sullivan is for me, having someone where we and to, literally to this day, last week, we are calling each other up and we're bringing each other to the bedside and showing each other physical findings. And, um, and that is really important. Again, this does not end after residency. And in fact, when I was a resident, I didn't have, um, I mean, I, I really didn't, I wasn't uh, as adept at, at taking a history or performing a physical exam or performing a hypothesis driven laboratory investigation as I am now. And you should absolutely continue to hone that skill in your career after residency. Um, and you know, it's sad how, how this stuff starts to atrophy. And this wasn't a talk on physical diagnosis. Um, and so I didn't really you know, make that point. But you know, if, you, if you look at our, our regular venous pulse talk, you know, there are examples, and I can give you example after example of how patients are you know, suffering with a symptom for months, and they have an, an obvious physical finding on examination that was completely missed because of the point that you made that we have our skills atro tend to atrophy and again history and physical are going to be 90 give you 90 percent of diagnoses and that's really where we should be focused and so yeah after residency you know please continue to <laughs> work on your diagnostic skills because it will it will save a patient's life it will it will prevent them from undue suffering um you know et cetera, and so forth hopefully that answered your question thank you a lot doctor thank you a lot no, okay, one somebody, of the questions in the chat is how do you yeah. consciously create frameworks and hypotheses, but also optimize your time while doing so? Well, my answer to that would be that having a framework w is going to save you time in the long run. Because again, remember, you know, you could ask every question in the world of a patient hoping to stumble upon an answer that helps you, or you could do a head to toe physical exam, hoping to stumble upon something that will help you. But that's going to be wildly inefficient. So the, having a frame, taking the time to generate a framework for a, for a patient is going to actually save you a lot of time. Because remember, the earlier you do it, the better, because now your interaction with that patient is going to be entirely hypothesis driven. And that is going to be the most efficient way to interact with that patient moving forward. How do I consciously create these frameworks? Well, sometimes it's subconscious, you know, um, I have these frameworks in my head. And as I'm interviewing the patient, I'm thinking if I'm seeing a patient with dyspnea, I'm thinking about cardiac causes, pulmonary causes, other causes. And you know, when I examine them, I'm thinking about the jugular venous pulse. Is it elevated or normal? That will help me figure out, is this a cardiac cause or is it a potentially a pulmonary or other cause? So some of this is, will come uh, just as second nature to you. But consciously, when I go back to my desk and I sit down and I think about this patient, I will pull up, if I'm seeing somebody with anemia, something that's so common that we see all the time. Sometimes we take that for granted and we don't consult a framework. And that's the most dangerous situation. Sometimes, you know, I will, I will uh, as a matter of habit, pull up that framework of a neat for anemia, just to make sure I'm not missing something. And just to make sure that, um, you know, I'm not just attributing that anemia to alcohol use when their MCV is elevated. And in fact, it's megaloblastic anemia. And I'm seeing that in the framework helps me think, I have to rule that in or out. And so that's how I consciously do it. And I, and I uh, sort of, you know, create sort of these up arrows or down arrows next to these etiologies thinking, okay, this is, this is more likely, or this is less likely. And, uh, and then when I'm left with some, some hypotheses that, uh, that I can then go back to the patient and ask questions, perform physical findings, order lab tests that will help me rule in or rule those out. Any plans to um, release the unreleased frameworks? Kushal, great question. I, thanks for asking that. I, I would say that, um, that, yeah, I mean, I think that, that you know, somewhere down the road, there's going to be you know, another, another edition of this book, but I, I don't think that's in the works anytime soon, um, mostly because these were the 50 most common problems 
that you encounter in internal medicine. And I would encourage you to create your own frameworks. That, that's the thing about, about this book is that it, it tells you in the end that you should begin to, to create your own frameworks, whether, you know, you have your own framework for something that, that is already in the book. You can tweak it your own way that makes you think of it, uh, you know, uh, more effectively, or there's a problem that's not in the book. You should, you, you know, should empower yourself to create your own framework for that because uh, you can do it and, and, um, and it will really help you. So there at some point, I'm sure will be a second edition of this book, but nothing, nothing anytime soon. Um, ID attending in India, uh, trained in adult internal medicine. Is there anything unique about diagnostic reasoning and ID that you could highlight? Um, not necessarily off the top of my head. Um, I mean, the, the examples that I see often are, you know, I'm a hospitalist, so I, I see patients who are admitted to the hospital. And a lot of the infectious diseases that I see uh, would be things like, you know, cellulitis or things like endocarditis. And something like endocarditis is associated with um, quite a few physical findings. And again, am I looking for splinter hemorrhages in every patient that I evaluate? No. Am I looking for, um, you know, Janeway lesions or Osler nodes in every patient that I evaluate? Absolutely not. Am I going to do a fundoscopic exam in every patient? No, that would take forever. I, I wouldn't be able to get through my day. So in that case, if I'm, if, if um, infective endocarditis enters into my brain, I am specifically, and it could be after, maybe I've already interviewed the patient. I come back to my desk and I realize, you know what? Endocarditis is on the differential here. That's a hypothesis. I need to go back and ask that patient about risk factors. Are they an IV drug user? Have they had a dental procedure recently? You know, do they have a central line? I'm going to look at physical findings, all the things I mentioned, splinter hemorrhages, et cetera, and so forth, a murmur on exam. You're going to pay specific attention to these things because that is on your differential diagnosis. And so, um, that, that's kind of how I would answer that question. Thanks for the, thanks for asking it. When will PDX website be accessible? We're hoping in the next few weeks. I know I keep saying that and there's, there's a very good, we're, we're ready to go with the website. There is a, uh, there is a, there is a, a reason why we haven't launched it that uh, I won't necessarily get into, but um, maybe someday I'll tell you, I'll tell you why our, our website launch has been delayed in this way, but we're ready to launch it. We have it all set up for you guys and ready to go. And we're hoping within the next few weeks that we'll be able to do that. Likelihood ratio. So, so Alberto, I'm glad you asked that question. You know, again, I, I would go back to, I, I like Steve McGee's book um, and I think it's very valuable. And I really like in theory what he has tried to do, which is to make physical diagnosis evidence-based. I think it's fantastic. But again, I would um, take some of those studies with a, with a large grain of salt because these likelihood ratios are based on studies in which they took medical students or residents in some cases and had them perform the exam. And then they, and then they try to conclude whether that exam finding or maneuver was worthwhile doing. Well, again, you know, that's more, more of a test of the test user than the test itself. I mean, I remember when I was a medical student being told that I would never see Kusmal sign, or I might see it once in my, in my career. I see it every week. I see it every time I'm on service, at least one time. These things are there to be seen and appreciated. You just have to have the skills. First of all, you have to have the motivation to look for them. You have to know to look for them. And then you have to have the skills to acquire that, those, those clues. And, um, you know, unfortunately, these studies were done with, you know, with, who, with individuals. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what their skills in physical examination are. And so, again, I would take those likelihood ratios with a grain of salt. Um, what do you recommend for studying heart sounds? Cardiac diagnosis is an audiovisual thing, absolutely, and I and I agree with that. And um, I, you know, I there's something called a phonocardiogram, which is the visualization. In fact, we showed the the heart murmur earlier in this talk, and that what I displayed there was a phonocardiogram, and that's where you can actually visualize the heart sounds S1, S2, the murmur, etc. And um, I think that's really really helpful. Uh, when you're learning cardiac sounds to have two inputs, not only what you're hearing, but you can also see what you're hearing at the same time. And that's what uh, we hope to accomplish with this website 
with physical diagnosis PDX, all of our, of our heart sounds will be associated with phonocardiograms. And uh, it will show you the cursor moving along the phonocardiogram and it will, it will play the audio at the same time. And that's a really great way for, for learning this stuff. So yeah, I would, uh, I would recommend um, our website, which, uh, which is coming out soon. And I, hopefully that will help you guys with cardiac auscultation. Any other questions? So well, just wanted yeah, to make uh, a point yeah, sure. uh, on the acquiring physical findings. Um, I think making the habit of acquiring the physical findings extremely important. Otherwise, sometimes if you're doing a shift in ER or in some, uh, some specialties, you just send them straight to CT. You don't even you know, care to even look at the patient or like actually try to look for some signs or symptoms. So uh, I think making a habit of acquiring is very crucial. And that's all I wanted to do. Yes, thank you for, um, for emphasizing that point. And I'll go back to that patient who had high output heart failure from, from wet berry berry. Most, I would say 95% of clinicians would have just said, you know, you're, you have the clinical syndrome of heart failure you have a normal echocardiogram, you have what we call heart failure with preserved systolic function. Here are some diuretics, you know, we'll treat you for your symptoms. Those physical findings, the wide pulse pressure and Quinky's pulse could change the complexion of that, ca that case completely. And it allowed for the, diagno the more specific diagnosis of high output heart failure and even more specifically from wet berry berry. And that allowed that patient to be cured of his heart failure. And so, yes, I would absolutely emphasize that Again, standardized tests have you synthesize information that is presented to you. You wanna be the clinician that understands what information I need to gather from a patient and you have the skills to go and, and the time and you make it a priority to take the time to go look and acquire those clues. Um, because again, it will, it, will, um, it will save patients from undue, undue harm and potentially you know, mortality if you do that. All right, well, the, the questions are starting to slow down. So I think that, that we're probably at the end of the session. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, John, for making that point. It's nice to see you, John. Uh, so John does a lot of work down in, in, in Haiti and uh, he makes the point here that um, prisoners in Haiti were dying of, 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 uh, of wet berry berry or, or berry berry in general, dry and wet berry berry um, just a few years ago. And so um, again, um, you know, it's important to go back to the basics and to take a proper history and to take an exam. And, and again, that is 90%. That will give you 90% of diagnoses. And I think that's a really crucial uh, point to make. Uh, yeah, from, from dietary issues. Thank you so much. Uh, let's see, going through the cases in the session was literally bringing your book to life. I'm glad that was the case. Saeed, thank you for that comment. Um, Hope to hear you again with Dr. Prasad soon. Thank you for the lessons. Um, you guys are very, very welcome. Thank you so much for, for joining. This was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed giving this talk um, and I enjoyed how interactive you guys were. You were reading my mind. I didn't even have to ask questions. You were already one step or two steps ahead of me the whole time. So thank you very much. Uh, next one, I don't know, Ricardo, we'll see, we'll see. Um, we'll definitely do it again at some point. Maybe pick a different topic to discuss. Austin, thanks for, for joining. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you guys very much. I think we'll probably call it there. It's 620. <laughs>